On a cold Saturday afternoon in Ypsilanti, Michigan, police responded to a home where a 49-year-old woman had been found, deceased in her bed. What they found inside the house was a sad and perplexing scene. A grandmother, due to collect one of her grandchildren for a visit that morning, was instead dead of an apparent overdose. It quickly became clear that there was more to this story than meets the eye. Hadn't a detective just visited with the victim? She was a key witness in a 25-year-old cold case, the disappearance of a good friend. Detectives believed that she knew something that could, finally, convict the killer. Except now, they found that she too had been silenced. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. The case we're about to look at is not really a single case, but rather two cases about two women which form one story. Their fates were linked by their connection to one man and the lengths that he would go to to cover up his crimes. Let's take a look. On Saturday, February 17th, 2018, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, Kristen McGeorge had grown concerned. Her mother, Martha, had not come to her house that morning to collect her grandson. Martha Agnew was usually very reliable. She was a mother and grandmother who was unfailingly supportive. Kristen traveled out to the rental home where her mother had been temporarily living to find that her car was in the driveway, but that the door was locked. There was no response from inside the house. Her stepfather, Gregory Agnew, was the only other person with a key, but he was not at home. When Greg arrived at the property that afternoon, Kristen ran inside, past an empty coffee pot and still playing TV, to the bedroom. There she found her mother wrapped in a blanket. She was not breathing. Martha was found lying in bed with a bloodied towel wrapped around her head. A plate of moist coffee grounds were found on the nightstand, along with a half-empty bottle of El Toro tequila. There was an exercise band next to her arm and a syringe on the chest of drawers. The totality of the scene, at first glance, pointed towards a drug overdose. This is exactly what police initially suspected had occurred, and there appeared to be drug paraphernalia scattered throughout the house. A closer inspection of the scene, however, raised a few red flags. The detective contacted Michigan State Police and the FBI to assist the investigation. Forensic teams found that blood had been cleaned in the bathroom, hallway, and second bedroom. Even more was cleaned on a laundry machine, a bucket, and the walls and floors. There was a shoe print in the hallway and spatter stains in the spare bedroom and bathroom. However, there was very little in the bedroom where Martha was actually found. Investigators reasoned that although it was common for a drug user to injure themselves, it was not typical for that person to clean up afterwards and arrange themselves in bed before succumbing to an overdose. Furthermore, despite the cleaning that had taken place, there were no signs of cleaning supplies. Teams processing the scene found an empty paper towel roll in the trash, for example but no soiled paper towels. The clues inside the house were not adding up. Until an autopsy was performed, investigators stayed tight-lipped about their suspicions. Meanwhile, they kept digging. The sheriff's office purposefully withheld particular details about the scene from the public, such as the nature of Martha's injuries. You said that she arrived at her home, um, got into the home and found her mother deceased. Uh, and so since that time, we've really been investigating, trying to find out uh, what's actually been going on. It was suspicious. There was nothing uh, clearly, like no blunt forces of trauma or anything like that. When the autopsy was conducted, the results confirmed the investigator's suspicions. The report showed no alcohol was present in Martha's system. This suggested that the opened tequila bottle, at least, had likely been planted. The medical examiner did find that Martha had potentially lethal levels of fentanyl and heroin in her blood, but was also confident that this did not cause her death. There were no signs of long-term drug use, and an examination of the items left at the scene uncovered more red herrings. 
The exercise band left by Martha's arm had ostensibly been used as a tourniquet, but the band was deemed far too thick to work properly. Similarly, the Washtona County Sheriff's detectives thought that the needles found in the home were unusually large. What they found was that these were actually designed to be used by veterinarians to treat animals. Then, the autopsy revealed what this staged scene was intended to conceal. Martha had sustained wounds consistent with a struggle before death. She had ultimately died from strangulation. The 49-year-old mother of three and grandmother to five had been murdered. Items from the house were sent for DNA testing. The results predictably showed that both Martha and her husband Greg's DNA was present throughout the house. This was not surprising as they shared the home together, though some of these DNA results had no innocent explanation. The needle found near to Martha's body contained DNA from not just Martha, but also from Greg. What was even more difficult for Greg to explain was how his DNA was found underneath his wife's fingernails. Investigators could not immediately reach Greg to ask for his explanation, however. While his stepdaughter, Kristen, stood in the driveway on the phone with 911, devastated after having just discovered her mother inside the house, Greg Agnew got into his vehicle and drove off. He remained absent for four full days. Calls to his cell phone went straight to voicemail. Messages went unanswered. On the day that she was killed, Martha had been married to Greg Agnew for just over three years. The two had been in a relationship, however, for many years prior. When Greg and Martha became a couple, he had a daughter named Donna from a previous relationship. Martha was a single mother to three children. Over the years, Greg became a father figure for Martha's kids, Michelle, Kristen, and their brother Jerry. They grew up calling Gregory Agnew dad, though he had only lived full time with their mother in recent years. Martha Agnew had earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and worked as a lead SAT reader. When Martha wasn't embracing her role as a mother and grandmother, she preferred to spend her free time immersed in a good book. She was also known for her helpful and caring nature. It was this trait that would, indirectly, lead her to marry Greg Agnew in the winter of 2014. The two first crossed paths many years earlier, however, in the summer of 1993, when one of Martha's good friends, Tammy Niver, went missing. On the 6th of August, 1993, Tammy was in a strained relationship with a then 25-year-old Greg Agnew. She collected her children and her belongings from his home and left to stay at a friend's house. Upon realizing that she had forgotten to pack her medication, Tammy returned to Greg's home. She was never seen again. The following day, Tammy's borrowed car was found in the middle of Cornell Road, near to Huron River Drive in Ypsilanti. The keys were still in the ignition. Friends told detectives that Greg was not good to Tammy. He was controlling, screened her phone calls, and dictated her relationships. Suspicions of Greg in the disappearance led police to a search of his apartment. Inside smelled of bleach, and there were full garbage bags and a shovel sitting in the hallway, despite the unit not containing any outside space. There was no landscaping to maintain, or other works that would necessitate the use of a shovel. The smell of bleach was especially strong in the bathroom, despite the rest of the apartment being described as messy and dirty. But there was not enough evidence tying Greg to Tammy's disappearance. Forensics in the early 90s were not what they are today. Flyers with Tammy's photo were circulated and information sought. Detectives would search through the woods bordering Eastern Michigan University, canine units on foot, and a helicopter overhead. They waded through the waters of the nearby Huron River, which connected the neighborhoods of Ypsilanti to the city of Ann Arbor to its west, but they came up empty. 25 years passed. Tammy's friends still held out hope that the case would be solved, but her body had not been recovered. The case against Greg Agnew grew cold. 
It's unbelievable that after all these years, she's not been found. Her family does deserve closure. Oh, yeah. Her daughters deserve that. Being a mom, I can't imagine what her kids are feeling. Do I think the police were just harassing him? No. No. Do I think the police... Do I think the well. police have good suspicion to suspect him? Yeah, for in sure. In both of them, then yes. Yes. A few days after Tammy disappeared, her friend, Martha Agnew, who was Martha McGeorge at that time, was given guardianship of Tammy's children. This arrangement held for the period of roughly three months, during which time Greg told friends that he wished to get close to Martha in order to stay close to the children. This circumstance seemed fortuitous to Martha. She believed that it placed her in a position to help catch her friend's killer. Martha contacted police and asked if she could help prove that Gregory Agnew was responsible for Tammy's death. She would wear a wire and attempt to elicit incriminating statements. No such statements made by Greg were recorded by Martha's undercover activities. Then, after a short time, she surprised law enforcement and her own family by starting a relationship with him. Martha was no longer assisting the police in their investigation. And her children began to call Gregory Agnew, Dad. In 2014, Ypsilanti police received a tip claiming that Martha had confided in a friend that Greg Agnew had admitted to killing Tammy. Working off of this information, in November of that year, police forced their way into the couple's home and arrested Greg for the murder. But when they questioned Martha about the tip, she would not divulge any incriminating information. She told law enforcement that she no longer believed that Greg was responsible for whatever had happened to Tammy. She told them that she believed it had been a random abduction. Later, Martha was placed under an investigative subpoena but she yet again refused to provide the information and answers that prosecutors anticipated. They were desperate to learn what she knew, but Martha was staying quiet. Greg was never formally charged with the murder. Moreover, according to local reports, a warrant had never been properly issued for his initial arrest either. Greg had been held unlawfully in the county jail. The investigative team in 2014 appeared to have no more evidence against him than they had in 1993. Greg later successfully sued the county over the ordeal and was awarded a settlement of $45,000. The arrest in late 2014 had obviously spooked Greg Agnew. He now wished to make things official with Martha. If the two were married, she could claim spousal privilege. She could not be compelled to reveal any secrets that she had carried about Tammy and Greg. The couple tied the knot at the end of 2014. According to family members, the wedding was intended to prevent Martha from having to testify again. Not surprisingly, the marriage was not a good one. Within three years, Martha was looking to get out. Through a domestic violence center, she arranged to hire a divorce attorney. While the process was underway, Martha moved out of the family home to live with her daughter, only to have a fire take down part of her house shortly after she made the move. Believing that Greg had started the fire, a dispute between the two began about who would receive benefits from the insurance company. Eventually, it was decided that the insurance would pay for a rental house that the two would share at set times. It was in this temporary rental that Martha would be found dead only weeks later. Greg Agnew was arrested yet again for murder and held in the county jail. This time, the arrest warrant was clear, and so was the motive. From a life offense, do you believe that the theory of murder in this case would be first degree premeditated murder, and would have your life without the possibility of soul? She had an orchestrated murder of his wife. We have strong evidence in this case that both circumstances and direct evidence of this uh, individual's guilt. Likely the conviction, you would suggest, a very strong, very high in these things. The defendant is also, Your Honor, uh, 
the prime suspect in, in another unsolved homicide case. I can tell you that that case is, is, as a result of this investigation, is actively being reinvestigated. Approximately a month before Martha's death, a police detective had become aware of the divorce and its contentious nature. He went to speak with Martha on January 18th, 2018, asking if she had any information about the disappearance of Tammy Niver. Martha denied having any new information, but she did text her estranged husband and told him that the detectives were asking yet again about Tammy and that they knew about the pending divorce. At that time, Greg had become aware that there would no longer be any barrier preventing Martha from telling police everything that she knew. Additionally, the only real asset in the marriage was the family home. Martha had brought it into the marriage and was likely to keep it in the divorce, leaving Greg with nothing. As he awaited trial, he used a quit claim deed to sign over the house to his mother and sister disinheriting Martha's children. Greg Agnew pleaded not guilty, and the case went to trial. His defense attorney, Ronald Gold, argued that evidence relating to Tammy Niver's case should be excluded. It was prejudicial to his client and irrelevant to the case, he said. The prosecution argued that silencing Martha, in addition to Greg's desire to acquire the family home, was the motive for the murder. She's out of the picture, especially by accident. Her house is his. That money coming in is his. No other plausible explanation. No one else wanted her dead. No one else needed to appear to be an accident. No one else is worried by a 26 year old cold case where the spouse, who's about to lose spousal privilege, could testify against. The defense suggested an alternative version of events. Gold argued that no one cleaned up or positioned Martha in the bed. This assertion disregarded the evidence found by FBI investigators in the hallway, bathroom, and second bedroom. Gold said she must have showered and cleaned up on her own before trying drugs with an unknown individual. He told the jury that the charges against Greg Agnew were nothing more than retaliation. Revenge for the lawsuit that he won against the county following his 2014 arrest. It was possible, Gold said, for Martha to have taken the needles that were in the house from the veterinarian's office when she was there for a checkup for her two dogs. Martha is doing drugs with a strange person. And then apparently something terrible went wrong. I don't know whether she wanted more or put together. The first two days of trial focused heavily on the facts that had been collected relating to the disappearance of Tammy Diver. Police admitted to making mistakes in the investigation by not collecting the full garbage bags or the shovel that they had observed inside Greg's apartment when first conducting the search back in 1993. By the time they returned, the items were gone. Friends of Greg's at that time testified that he wondered aloud to them after a few drinks what it would be like to strangle someone. Other friends told the jury that more recently, after Martha's death, Greg had told them that she died of blunt force trauma. Detectives had purposefully withheld information about her head wound, not just from the public, but everyone, including Martha's children. Yet somehow, Greg had known. Greg later claimed that he did not go into the bedroom to see his wife on the day she was found. Kristen testified that he had viewed the scene in the house right before he drove off. And then when I screamed, he said, what, what, and he saw it too. My dad got in his truck and he left me there with my mother dead. Unlike Tammy's case, the evidence that Greg killed his wife was abundant. There was no sign of forced entry at the house. Greg had a key. His DNA was under her fingernails. Additionally, investigators in the days after Martha's death had acquired the blue jumpsuit that Greg had been wearing when he met with Kristen at the house that morning. Analysis of blood stains on that jumpsuit revealed that Martha was a contributor. 
The scene was staged to look like a drug overdose, and his DNA was on the syringe placed near her body. She had bled from a head wound, yet the house was cleaned and her head wrapped in a towel. Two witnesses recalled Greg saying that someone could cover up the scent of a dead body by using coffee grounds. There were coffee grounds found scattered at the scene. Could you have said something like that? It's possible. If you did say something like that, did you mean it? No, it would only be about coffee ground when you see it on TV where they cover the, the drug traffic. That's the only thing I know about coffee ground. Did you ever say anything or do you ever remember say anything about being able to inject somebody with something so that... No. I, I'm afraid of needle anyway. Look at the jury. I want to ask you, did you have anything at all to do with the death of Mark? No, I did not. When Greg Agnew took the stand, he appeared the same way that he had during his pre-trial hearing, that is, confused and slightly disoriented. Phone number? I don't, I, don't, I don't know about heart. Told that he had a constitutional right not to speak at trial, he responded, Okay, I won't. Then, after a discussion with counsel, he took the stand after all. Greg's behavior during his testimony was extremely abnormal. It came as a surprise to not only the prosecution, but family and friends who had known and interacted with the man for years. Family reported that they thought he was behaving as though he was too stupid to comprehend what was happening, and that he was faking a stutter. At times during his testimony, Greg appeared to, to mouth words mid-sentence before speaking them. He avoided eye contact and seemed to struggle to recall basic facts. He began his testimony stating that he was 53 years old, though he was in fact 51 at that time. Testimony that you used your key and unlocked the handle, and you and Kristen went into the house? Yes. You walked into the kitchen, correct? Yes. And Kristen walked down the hallway, the bedroom where the bed is, correct? I believe so. Did you see her do that? No, I didn't. You're just standing in the kitchen? Yes. You hear a scream, correct? I don't remember hearing a scream. Okay. You never looked in that bedroom? I don't know. You never looked at Martha laying in the bed dead? I don't know. I thought you had a good memory of February 17, 2018. I don't recall. So you leave that house, Kristen's crying, calling 911 in the driveway, and you get in your F-150 parked in front of the house, correct? I don't recall. You don't call 911 because your wife was found dead in the bedroom, do you? I don't recall. Gregory Agnew was found guilty of first-degree murder. Yes! Yes! At his sentencing, Martha's family pushed back against her portrayal by the defense team at trial. She was not into drugs. Martha was a loving and dependable sister, mother, and grandmother. In 1993, Martha was recently divorced from the father of her three children. She was doing her best to raise her two daughters and son all on her own. When her friend Tammy went missing, she felt she could be of some help in trying to get you, Greg, to confess. But just like Tammy, she was manipulated by you. Martha was a very vulnerable young mother, and somehow you warmed her way, your way into her needy heart. You didn't care for her, and you surely didn't love her. Greg, you only used her to try and make yourself look innocent in Tammy's disappearance. This was a low point for our family when we realized she was seeing you. Greg, I watched my sister from 2009 till her death. I watched you control her, manipulate her, intimidate her, and live in fear. That Christmas of 2009, I literally had to go in my parents' bathroom and threw up when I heard Michelle and Kristen call you dad. The Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office has stated that the case of Tammy Niver is still in open investigation. Gregory Agnew is the prime suspect in her disappearance, 
even though she has never been found. Greg received a mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Martha Agnew. He maintains his innocence, even while his family begged him to reveal Tammy's location and allow her family justice and closure. I don't understand how anyone can take a mother away from their kids. <laughs> Not once, but possibly twice. I'm disgusted and hurt that you did these things and are sitting there with these secrets. Where is Tammy, Dad? <laughs> After the conviction, Martha's children launched a legal battle to have the family home, which had been their grandmother's before it was their mother's, returned to them. After the appeal of Greg's conviction failed, they finally had the home returned. And that was the chilling case of Tammy Niver and Martha Agnew. A special thanks to our latest channel member, Kel, who joined earlier this week. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.